And yeah, so my name is Anand Raghunath, and I'm going to talk today about what happens to cryptography when we have quantum computers that are online, uh, scalable, and are sort of breaking hard problems. So uh, this is going to be uh, talking about work with a lot of people, uh, including my collaborators. So this is definitely not just my work alone, uh, but I'm happy to take, take all the credit here. Um, there's a standard disclaimer. It's not as nice as the previous disclaimer, uh, but uh, the views and opinions here are basically my own. Uh, they don't reflect my employer, Google, or you know, my collaborators. Uh, and I can be somewhat highly opinionated, so it's good to have this disclaimer. Uh, so what's the agenda for this, uh, for this talk? So I want to motivate a little bit, so that at least from a cryptography perspective, what is the need to think about uh, cryptography in this post-quantum era, basically. Uh, then I'll tell you a little bit about what are the new flavors of cryptography in this new era. So if you've ever heard of lattice-based cryptography and you don't know what that is, but you're curious in finding, finding out more about it, well, uh, today's your lucky day. So you will be talking about lattice-based cryptography, and I'll also tell you a little bit about some other forms of crypto. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, some work that we did ourselves, so included, uh, with my collaborators. So we had a submission to the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, NIST. This is a U.S. Uh, uh, government body that runs these competitions, crypto competitions, and they've been very highly successful. Uh, they have a new one on post-quantum crypto, and we had a submission on a key exchange mechanism uh, called Frodo Chem. I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, then I'll also talk to you about quantum secure signature schemes. So in cryptography, there are two broad classes of uh, technologies available. So one is called encryption for protecting the, integ for the confidentiality or the secrecy of your messages so that they are hidden. And then you have signatures that protect the integrity. In other words, you make sure that people are not tampering with your messages. So both of these are orthogonal. They're both important. Uh, I've done mostly work on the first, so that is a key exchange stuff, but I'll tell you a little bit about signatures. And then finally, if there's some time, we'll talk about some work, some experiments that have been done on deploying this sort of post-quantum crypto in the, in the Google Chrome browser. So let's get started. So let's uh, motivate why we're all here and why I'm giving this talk. Uh, if you connect to the internet today, uh, and uh, banking is where sort of most, most of the uh, impact of uh, encryption happens in, in, in the internet or e-commerce. So you'll usually be greeted with a big prompt that looks like this if you go, go in through the details. So TLS here is a protocol. Uh, ECDHE stands for elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman encryption. Uh, and uh, ephemeral, sorry. And that requires the hardness of something called the elliptic curve discrete log. Uh, if you don't know exactly the details or you haven't heard about this, don't worry about it. Uh, but I just want to point out all the various components of cryptography that go into, say, just a simple connection. Uh, the first two, the elliptic curve, Diffie-Hellman, uh, ephemeral, and RSA, are based on hard problems. So all cryptography is based on hard mathematical problems that we have good confidence of believing that they can't be solved easily. And this based on hard problems called elliptic curve discrete log and something called the hardness of factoring, which is that you have two big prime numbers, you multiply them, I give you the product of the two prime numbers, and I ask you to find out, give me the factors. So these constitute what is broadly called public key cryptography. So the idea is that you and I want to communicate with each other, but we have never interacted, we have never spoken to each other, we don't have any ways of exchanging keys, uh, but we still want to communicate. So that is public key crypto. Once you've established keys that we both of us, uh, the both of us have in common that no one else has, then we can do what is called symmetric key uh, cryptography, which is much faster. And that's what is used for encrypting the rest of your data when you connect to an internet. So if you're having a gigabyte YouTube video, you're not going to use public key crypto for the whole YouTube video. You're going to quickly establish a secret key uh, using public key crypto and then encrypt everything using the last two building blocks. So these are all the building blocks that goes into, say, cryptography, both in the internet and outside. What happens if you have a quantum computer? Well, the first two are, you're in trouble, basically. So uh, Shor, uh, the famous mathematician in 1994, and one of the audience members pointed out, so he basically came and said, hey, uh, you guys are all in trouble because elliptic curve, discrete log, and hardness of factoring are, are much easier to solve with a quantum computer than they are with a classical computer. And if you're familiar with a little bit of complexity theory, we believe these problems are at least sub-exponentially hard, or they, they require time that's almost exponential in the size of the input. But with uh, quantum algorithms, you can do it in time that's polynomial in the size of the input. So much, much, much faster. Uh, Love Grover was another uh, computer scientist, uh, roughly around the same time, showed that uh, symmetric key cryptography could also be in trouble. Uh, what he did was he said, if you have a database of size n and you want to look it up, uh, classically, you need to sort of see roughly n over two of the uh, databases, uh, database, uh, pro so what do you call it, database inputs, before you can actually stumble upon your answer, right? So imagine if you have no other prior information, you just have to do some sort of brute force search. A quantum, uh, quantum computers let you do something fancier, so you saw briefly a little bit what happened, like what the previous talk talked about, where you could superpose states and so on. And he showed that you don't need to search a database in time uh, n, but sort of in time square root of n. 
So if you think about a huge database of cryptographic keys, say two to the 80 keys that you want to search over, now suddenly you only need time that's like two to the 40. So it's still not very practical, but it's much easier than it was before. It's not completely broken, but we are in a little bit of danger. Luckily, it's easy to fix the second half where you just simply double the key sizes, so effectively double the key sizes. And uh, these standards like AES, which is called the Advanced Encryption Standard, um, uh, and SHA, which is for used for, uh, for basically hash functions for signatures. So those are much easier to fix. And there are already standards out there. You can just move to 256-bit keys and 384-bit uh, values for the digest. But uh, for public key crypto, so for elliptic curvy Hellman and RSA, we are in trouble. We still don't have substitutes that are as, as easy to fix. So that's the motivation. So a uh, lot of internet commerce could be at risk. Uh, and are quantum computers getting practical? Well, I actually gave this talk about four, four, four or five months back at a quantum industry, quantum computing industry conference in the Bay Area. Uh, and there were all these sponsors, so I just picked all of them up and I said, hey, all you guys are working on quantum computers. And so therefore it's pretty clear that quantum computers are getting more and more practical. There's a lot of startups that are investing in it. Of course, the big players, including my own employer, Google, Microsoft, IBM, they're all sort of working hard on getting quantum computers practical. So therefore, this problem is not theoretical, it's not just mathematical, but we will be in trouble when, in the future, how, how many years it might take, that there's a quantum computer that scales up to the sort of sizes that we're talking about. Um, in industry, uh, things kicked off with a much higher pace, in case you noticed it in the last few years. And I believe there's one reason why, at least, it happened in the US, which is that uh, the National Security Agency uh, has this Information Assurance Directorate, which is a sort of subgroup of it, and they just announced in 2015, in August 2015, that they're going to transition all the quantum, uh, transition all their algorithms to quantum resistant algorithms and not too distant future. So they said this without any prompting, and this is the NSA, so obviously everyone is very curious. Then they went and published this report on the sort of state of post-quantum crypto back then, and the NIST organization, uh, which is sort of works closely with, with, with the NSA, immediately started this timeline for this post-quantum crypto competition. So everyone was wondering that maybe there's something up in the air or maybe they're just being cautious, like out of abundance of caution. But that got all the industry players really uh, sort of serious. Uh, and uh, everyone is participating, a lot of them are participating in this NIST competition, in case you've heard of it. Uh, I also like this slide because every time I give this talk, the, the little red bar keeps moving down. So they're progressing fairly, uh, fairly as planned according to the timeline that they themselves put out. Uh, and this is uh, a way to focus the entire community. There's a lot of people both in industry, in academia, mathematicians, to focus all their efforts on trying to get out good post-quantum crypto candidates. So right now, we are somewhere sort of right in the middle of it, I think, so between the deadline and when they're going to have analysis periods and they're going to have standards ready and so on. Uh, and if you want a more fancy way of saying this, I think this is their own headline, which is like we're now in the semi-final stage of this competition. So there are about 80 algorithms submitted and now they've pruned them down and now there are 26 algorithms, I think about 10 or 12 for a key exchange, the remaining for signatures. Now people are going to focus and analyze these with more scrutiny. Um, so what are the challenges of post-quantum crypto? So when you're talking about post-quantum crypto, there are a lot of things that you're actually talking about. You're talking about designing just simply better key exchange and signature schemes. So we'll be talking about that today. So there's like math and protocol design involved. Uh, but it just doesn't stop there. Uh, post-quantum crypto, development in post-quantum crypto also means you try to improve the attacks themselves. So you're both building things up and also attacking them uh, sort of fervently to make sure that you have a good understanding of exactly how secure these things are. So cl uh, classical crypto, or traditional crypto, like such as RSA, uh, elliptic curves, uh, these were around for like three or four decades and they were fairly uh, stable and people had good idea, good understanding. Quantum, post-quantum crypto schemes are much newer to the scene. So they're like the new kids on the block. They've been around for 10 years or so, which is not a small amount of time, but still not enough to give us a lot of confidence. So we need to invest a lot more in improving these attacks while we're designing better schemes. And while we sort of improve these attacks, we also have better ideas of what are the parameter sizes, so how big these things need to be before they're actually secure. So that's also a very careful task that you do. Then once we have these schematics and we have standards, we need to actually develop fast and secure implementations. And of course, a fast implementation is not necessarily a secure one. You could leak information about the state. You need to uh, take care of those sorts of things. You don't need to have bugs in code and so on. And then finally, you need to sort of integrate them into existing infrastructure. And my colleagues at like Google who do much more engineering work, uh, I just do sort of the more fun research stuff. They will say that this is actually the hardest part because uh, infrastructure is, is, is so huge today. It's, it's all over the place. There are like various different standards that are interacting in very careful ways. And you can't just simply come and tell them, hey, you have this particular algorithm, just replace this all over the place. That's a multi-year effort it takes to replace infrastructure. And which is why companies are investing in this very actively. So there's a lot of this that's going on in post-quantum crypto, uh, but I'll mainly talk about the first point. I'll talk about trying to design a better post-quantum key exchange scheme. What does it even mean? And briefly talk about signature schemes. So like I said, I'll mostly talk about key exchange. 
I'm not even, talk, not even focus so much about signatures for one very important reason. Uh, the premise that I want to sort of get across is that even though we don't have quantum computers today, today's communication is still sort of under attack uh, by, uh, again, sort of by a future adversary, right? Because all you need to do is you need to store communication that you have today, keep it in a safe place somewhere, and then wait for this quantum computer of scale to appear. You can go back and crack all the encrypted uh, communication that you have stored for whatever reason you might want to do that. So TLS traffic and messages are encrypted today, I just want to get this across to you, if nothing else goes across in the talk, is that they are vulnerable from attacks that are decades uh, in the future, okay? So we need to be really careful about that and we need to start moving to post-quantum key exchange as soon as we can. Uh, signature schemes, I mean, they're still problematic, but we can still do them with traditional primitives because if I were to uh, forge signatures and sort of fake you visiting google.com, for example, I need, to, using a quantum computer, I need to have that quantum computer online and alive today, right now. So my uh, sort of communication with Google.com today is still always is, is still going to be protected. It's still in, uh, the integrity is still maintained. It's only the confidentiality that might be broken in the future. Uh, and you might say, okay, so uh, why would someone ever be storing all this internet uh, communications, and what are they going to do with it? So I'll just leave this headline from like a few years back about the NSA without without much comment. Uh, but we need to protect today's communications against tomorrow's adversaries. Okay. So I hope I hope I've convinced you of that. So this is the motivation for the rest of the talk. We're going to talk about post quantum key exchange mostly. And let's see what's the new sort of flavors of cryptography we're going to use to, to deal with this uh, problem. Uh, so the cryptography of the past looked a lot like exponentiation. So it said you have these nice groups, you exponentiate them to, prob to sort of secret powers, and, and life is good. What is the cryptography of the future going to look like? It's going to look pretty surprisingly mundane. It's going to be matrix vector multiplication, okay? So it's a bit anticlimactic. Post-quantum crypto, if you want to go back and tell your friends, it's just we're just multiplying matrices and vectors. Uh, so this is a problem called learning with errors problem, and all of cryptography is built off of these sort of so-called hard problems, or at least simple, easy problems that we believe are hard, and then we can analyze how hard they are. And a lot of uh, post-quantum key exchanges, uh, or these lattice-based crypto, is built, up of, built off of this problem called learning with errors. So let's see what it's about. Uh, so imagine I gave you this matrix A, and I had a secret vector X, and I told you, hey, I give you A, and I give you the output of A times X. So can you solve for X, basically? And uh, this is not a trick question, the answer is yes, it's easy to solve. This is done in high school, you just do what is called Gaussian elimination, right? You can sort of eliminate uh, one row of, at a time of this, this matrix A and then recover the values of X uh, coordinate by coordinate, okay? So imagine here uh, these matrices are of size, say hundreds, hundreds of dimensions each. What happens if you add a little noise, okay? So now it starts to get a little more interesting. So I give you this output A times X, but then I add some noise or I flip a few bits or I sort of add a small amount of error in each of the coordinates. And then I ask you, hey, can you find out x? So, well, the answer is depends on how you add the noise, right? So if you add very little noise, it's probably still easy. If you choose a matrix A, which actually is cleverly constructed to be some sort of an error correcting code, then you're specifically designing this matrix A to actually try to correct for some errors and recover a code word, so to say. That is a little different. Here we have a random matrix A. So it's not always easy to correct for these uh, noise, and that's why it's called learning with errors, basically. And the answer is, uh, it turns out in 2005, uh, cryptographers sort of looked at this from a cryptographic lens. Uh, Oda Dregev basically showed that if E comes from this sort of high dimensional Gaussian distribution, and the width of this Gaussian can be much smaller than the actual sort of domain from which these values are coming from. So notice here that this is coming from all the integers modulo some, some number Q, doesn't necessarily have to be prime. Uh, for simplicity, you can think of them as like 16 bit numbers. He showed that even if this uh, noise is drawn from a Gaussian distribution that has sort of width just like say minus five to plus five or minus 10 to plus 10, really, really narrow width, it still turns out that it might be a difficult problem to recover this value x. So this is a concrete problem that I can pose called search learning with errors problem. I can then, sort of for a lot of cryptography, it's not sufficient to just say you can't recover the whole secret, but you also want to say things like no matter what I do with the secret, even little bits of information cannot be leaked. And the way to sort of mathematically phrase that is to say that we're going to go to what is called the distinguishing problem. So we say that I give you a, a distribution that is generated using this A times X plus some noise, uh, and X here is supposed to be secret, and then I give you just some random junk, okay? And I say you can't distinguish between these two scenarios, even if the noise is drawn from this sort of small and seemingly easy to correct distribution. Uh, the reason why this is exciting is because now whenever there's this A times X plus noise where X is a secret in the protocol, I can just replace that person with like completely random noise. I know it's independent of any user secrets and I can go on with my life knowing that if you were able to sort of find a difference between these two things, then you'd be able to solve this hard problem. So, so long as this hard problem continues to remain hard, uh, the scheme that I built up happens to be secure. So that's sort of how cryptography is built and that's how we, we have some understanding or some belief that the protocols that we design and deploy are actually secure. 
So this is called the learning with errors problem. And then just for technical reasons, I will say that uh, what we need in the rest of the talk is also we need the noise values, the, the secret values themselves to be drawn from the same distribution, okay? So this is all there is to sort of uh, cryptography, lattice-based cryptography. You have matrices, they're random matrices, you have these secrets. Secrets are drawn from maybe special distributions. You do matrix vector multiplication, then add some noise, and then it turns out it's hard, given the right dimensions and the right parameters and so on and so forth, to actually recover these secrets or even distinguish these secrets uh, from random values, okay? Uh, of course, you might uh, sort of stop me here and say, okay, why should this matrix A be random? What happens if it's not random? Uh, if I told you that the matrix A is like 100 dimensions long, then quickly someone might do the math and say, hey, this means that the values you're dealing with are like megabytes long. And typical cryptography is, is like much, much smaller than that. It's only a few hundred bytes. So can we sort of shrink things? Can we make things shorter? Turns out people were thinking about this stuff. and They didn't always have A that was a completely random matrix. So they said, okay, what happens if A has additional structure? So imagine if A is a cyclic matrix, where each row of the matrix is uh, just a rotation of the previous row. What are the advantages? Well, the advantages are that there is much less storage involved, right? So the sizes of everything that you're dealing with is much smaller because you can compact A. And also, A times X uh, now becomes a much more, it becomes an easier to compute operation using fast Fourier transforms because there's some additional cyclic structure. And everything you're dealing with is, in, is, uh, is now objects in, in, in uh, is basically ring objects. And so they, it's called a ring learning terrorist problem. Uh, and this was also discovered and people worked on this and they said how to try to make this more efficient. Tomorrow in the future, uh, if you come across the crypto schemes that are called NTRU or NTRU prime or something called module LWE or ring LWE, now you know exactly what, what, what it's talking about. It's just the same LWE problem, but this matrix A now has some very special structure and there are good reasons for the special structure, okay? Of course, there's also problems with the special structure, which is that you need to carefully instantiate this ring and the noise. So people have shown that if you sort of simply go ahead and just try to choose any ring structure that you want to impart to this sort of problem, then you might be in trouble. Uh, there are some probably weak ring and noise instances. So just going to ring LW and trying to make things faster for you to be post-quantum secure might just actually break the whole thing. And it also turns out that there are some quantum attacks on some sort of approximations of some problems uh, that happen to be easier if you, if you choose the wrong ring. So long story short, we have LW, we have ring LW, and you really need to be careful with the ring because that you need to be, it's like it comes a lot of power, but there's a lot of responsibility attached to it. Uh, so in that vein, my uh, colleagues and I proposed this uh, paper that sort of thoroughly explored whether uh, non-ring LW or just sort of uh, key exchange from generic lattices would be secure and would be practical. And it appeared at a, a computer uh, security conference actually right here in Vienna. So it looks like I show up every few years here and talk about post-quantum crypto, which is not the worst thing in the world. Uh, so this was this uh, thing called Frodo CCS, uh, which is our submission that we submitted to this conference. Um, and now I'll tell you sort of how we build off what this looks like and how this leads to this NIST submission and what an actual post-quantum key exchange looks like. Uh, for those of you who, who know Diffie-Hellman key exchange, then this is going to be sort of very simple. But if you don't know, let me tell you what like a pre-quantum key exchange looks like. So uh, today's communication happens as follows. So you and I want to communicate, and we have sort of never spoken to each other, but you want to share a secret that only the two of us know at the end of the, uh, end of the protocol. How do we do this? Well, let's assume that there's some generator G that's out there, which is part of some group. You don't need to know too many details about it. Uh, I just pick a random value X from a large set of values, and I publish G to the X. Uh, the discrete log problem basically says, even if I give you g to the x, it's hard to recover the value x, right? It's hard to do discrete log. You do the same thing. You pick a value y, you compute g to the y, you send it across to me. Now, both of us can compute g to the x, y, right? Because I just take your value g to the y and then raise it to my secret power x, and you do the exact opposite. Both of us end up computing g to the x, y, but then there is this very famous and celebrated result in cryptography that in fact sort of kick-started or launched a lot of uh, the modern crypto, which is called the Diffie-Hellman assumption, which basically states, uh, this is these two cryptographers, Whitfield Diffie and uh, Martin Hellman, they basically said that, hey, you know what, if you publish g to the x and g to the y, maybe it's hard to compute g to the xy. Maybe it's hard to even distinguish g to the xy from a random value. This is a simple, easy to propose problem, where right? you can go home, try to like throw your fanciest algorithms at it and try to crack it. And we have studied this problem for 30, 40 years, and it's actually a hard problem to do. So in other words, you can do this sort of communication. Both of us can publish these values g to the x and g to the y knowing that even if an adversary sees these values, they're not going to learn our secret. Our secret is still going to be hidden. But magically, at the end of it, we end up both getting the same value g to the x, y, and then we can, now we have a shared key. And now we can do whatever we want with it. We can like, kind of derive keys from this and then throw symmetric key uh, cryptography just much faster uh, than public key cryptography. 
So this is the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and this is what runs a lot of the internet today. So if you see ECDHE in your sort of little in your browser today, this is exactly what's going on. So you already now you know that. Um, with lattices, you do basically the same thing. Kind of you squint at it, it's sort of you're doing the same thing. You want to hide a secret X. There's no exponentiation going on here, but you know what? You have this matrix A that you can publish. And if you do A times X, it's kind of easy to solve for X. But if you do A times X plus noise, now suddenly Anant is telling me that it's difficult. Well, actually, like yeah, in, in, in O5, I show that it's difficult. So maybe I hide the secret X in this way, right? Similarly, the other person hides the secret Y in the same way. And now both of us can compute Y times A times X, but not quite because we have this uh, annoying error terms that are there for security. But the advantage is that because the noise is small and the secrets are small, uh, the product of them is also still small, and you can actually agree upon a sort of close enough value to y times a times x. So now, suddenly what happens is that this sort of key exchange protocol has a failure probability, but it's not a big deal. Uh, and the agreement between these two values, maybe you don't agree upon the exact value y times a times x, but you agree upon maybe the more significant bits of the value. So you have some amount of noise that you can quickly correct for. So this is basically key exchange. So this is what sort of post-quantum key exchange looks like. So it says you take matrices that are public, you add your secret vectors, multiply them, add some noise to hide them, and then when you get these noisy values, you somehow derive this uh, joint secret between the two of you and hope that like the noise and everything is, is taken care of, okay? So let's look at it in a little more detail. So this is a big protocol. I don't want to go through that in the interest of time, but let me just show you what happened. So this is the value that's being published by Alice, which is A times S plus noise. This is the value published by Bob, which is B times S prime times A plus noise. And it looks exactly like this decision learning errors problem, doesn't it? It says decision learning errors, what did it say? It said that A times S plus noise can just be replaced by a random value, and you wouldn't be able to tell the two apart. So we are effectively sending random values back and forth. Uh, and then both, value, both of them end up agreeing upon this sort of joint secret, there's some extra steps that need to, need to take place to make sure that you agree upon exactly the same value and not some sort of close approximations of the, two, of the same values, but you can do all of that. There's some more technicalities that I don't want to go into too many details, but just let you know that even though this matrix A is pretty big, we don't need to send it back and forth. We can save on communication by generating it like in a pseudo-random fashion. So these are some technical details just to sort of reduce the communication. Uh, and this is basically the key exchange. This is all there is to it. So there are a few steps here. There's some matrix vector multiplication. You notice here that this uh, distribution chi is a special sort of Gaussian distribution that we choose from to make sure that things are hard. And that's all there is to this sort of key exchange. Uh, at this point, of course, now all of you are going to be super excited and you're going to go implement it, right? Well, uh, maybe not. But uh, there is uh, something important that you need to do if you're actually going to deploy this in the wild, which is you need to make sure that even today, if you're going to deploy this, you're going to do in what is called a hybrid mode. So you are going to deploy post-quantum crypto along with traditional crypto for one simple reason, which is we don't have like entire confidence that post-quantum crypto, like we have the right uh, security levels or we have the right parameters or things are hard enough. So the worst thing could happen is if you only deploy post-quantum crypto, and then in the future, it turns out that quantum computers are still struggling to get to be scaled up for whatever reasons, but then our analysis, our mathematical analysis of these lattice-based problems was like completely suspect, and then some enterprising grad student comes and breaks the whole thing. Then not only are, is our security not better than classical crypto, but it's actually become worse. So we need to deploy both of them together. Uh, and if you ever come across someone who's not doing this, well, run away. Um, and uh, sort of we practice what we preach in Chrome, uh, which is one of my colleagues' work. We actually implemented this experiment a few years back. We have this sort of new, new phase that includes both elliptic curve DSA, uh, elliptic curve uh, protocols, as well as post-quantum crypto. Um, then we sort of built up upon this, but I'm not going to bore you with all the details. Uh, all I'm going to say is that uh, our NIST proposal was built off of this sort of Frodo proposal, so the rough outline remains the same. But so we still deal with generic lattices. We have a very simple design, uh, but we have more secure parameters. So there was a more careful analysis of the hardness of these things, and we also had what is a more comprehensive security analysis. Which sort of, for lack of time, all I want to say is that we looked at the complete end-to-end -end sort of security as opposed to just security of these individual uh, steps that we are taking care of. So for some technical reasons, the uh, uh, sort of we left some things or we swept some things under the rug in the previous proposal that we sort of fleshed out in, in, in our next proposal. So this is kind of what uh, kind of people are doing on post-quantum research, what they're doing today, and what a typical proposal might look like for this competition. Uh, of course, so you might stop me here and say, okay, all of this is great, but how do you know it's secure? Like, why, why do you believe it's secure? So uh, Diffie-Hellman assumption was standing for 40 years, and so therefore we believe it's secure, but you know it got broken by quantum computers. Why can't the same thing be true of learning with errors problem, right? Well, it is true, that is a concern, uh, but like that's true for all of cryptography. We don't actually have provable ways of showing hardness because that will require you to, solve, to show that P not equal to NP. 
so we have to make certain assumptions, but you make these assumptions sort of reasonably and easy to test out. But there are some heuristics for wh why we think like sure or grower like algorithms or why some of the tricks of like superposition uh, that was used in the previous talk might not work for lattice space crypto. And the reason here is simple. I'll try to sort of explain it to you in like maybe half a minute. Uh, the reason here is that uh, what Shore and Grover algorithms, what they do is they do something very clever. So they allow you to find periods in a function. It's a function that is periodic with a hidden period. Well, by that I mean you take a function, you evaluate it on like x and x plus something and x plus something, like two times something and so on. It starts to circle back. It starts to come back to the original value of f of x. So the sort of, the, the, the fact that f of x plus a period or plus two times a period equal to f of x, this is a periodic function and what these quantum algorithms let you do is they let you sort of query these functions at a superposition of points and then recover these periods in, in ways that are much faster than doing it classically, which is just evaluating the function and seeing when it loops back, okay? So at a very high level, they do period finding and they do it well. And then you might stop to say, hold on a minute, like you have matrices, you have vectors, you have vectors that are orthogonal to matrices. Uh, why is it called lattices? It's called lattices because it's actually a discrete subgroup of this sort of whole points of space in like in some higher dimension, right? You can just shift them by these sort of points that are like orthogonal to the matrix A and you get the lattice. The lattice keeps repeating. So it looks like what you're saying is that it's exactly the sort of problem that Shore or Grover like algorithms should be able to nail. And the reason that is not true is because, notice that I didn't say that it's hard to find uh, something about the lattice because the lattice description is public. What I told you, it's hard to find short vectors or it's hard to sort of correct from a small amount of noise. So uh, like one of the reasons why I believe personally that the heuristics don't work is because we are dealing with some inherent notion of metric here. We're not dealing with periods, even though there's a periodic structure. We're dealing with things that are like close elements or short elements and so on. And therefore this kind of makes it hard for us to sort of shoo in this period finding algorithm and try to make exponential improvements in, 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 in quantum attacks. But of course, like, I don't know if any of this, what I said is true. Uh, it could be complete, complete uh, sort of nonsense for all I know, so just treat it with caution. Uh, but it's just a heuristic, it's just a way to try to understand why this might be true. But what we do uh, actually uh, focus on in the community is we evaluate progress in a very rigorous way of state-of-the-art attacks. So uh, this is just kind of a very fancy graph to throw at you to sort of say that each of these points in this graph is an entire research paper trying to show how to improve either the speed or to improve the, the amount of space these algorithms take or some combination of the two. We're actually studying the combinations exactly how the two work out. So there's a lot of active work that's going on not just in algorithms attacking lattice-based crypto, but also doing some fundamental sort of like counting sort of analysis. So by enumeration anal analysis, I mean, we simply look at the space of problems like we need to solve, a space of points we need to explore to solve. We don't assume that we can sort of, even getting to the space of problems is hard, but just the fact that there is this huge exponential amount of space of problems to solve, turns out to be hard enough. So there is some very fundamental, uh, sort of very conservative ways of evaluating lattice-based attacks that is happening as we speak in the community. And we sort of rely on the latest of these attacks, apply them to our systems or all the other NIST systems to make sure that it is secure. And then there's also backed by theory, and this is sort of what excites me, which is that uh, there's a very cute uh, uh, sort of property of lattice-based crypto that is not there in a lot of other crypto systems. So it's something called worst case to average case reductions. It's a very fancy way of saying that if there are some lattices that are hard, we, do, we might not know what they are, it might not even be obvious to sort of get this nice A on which these problems are hard. But if there are some lattices that are hard, then we can actually show that if you pick a random lattice, then it turns out that it's gonna be hard on that also, okay? This is not true for a lot of crypto. If I pick a random group, it's not obvious at all that the Diffie-Hellman problem is hard on a random group. We need to carefully choose the group and there's a lot of work that goes into this and there's one standard group that all of like the internet uses. Uh, and it's a NIST standard. Uh, but this is true for, la for lattice-based crypto. You just pick A randomly, and then if there are some hard lattices out there, then we know for a fact that this, this particular problem we're working with, with this specific randomly chosen lattice A, is still hard. So that means that there's something inherent to sort of these hardness problems. It's not, it, it's not dependent on the structure of this place you're playing with, but it's rather dependent on these like short errors versus long errors and so on. Again, a lot of this is sort of very high level pontification, if you will, and it's like almost philosophy, uh, but uh, that sort of gives us some, some uh, confidence that this po like we have post-quantum security. So now back to Earth. So uh, what do these post-quantum sort of schemes look like? We have three security levels. I just want to show you kind of concrete numbers here because that's what we need for, for the future. So N here is the dimensions of the lattice and you can see here we're dealing with like a few hundred dimensional lattices, 600, 900, 1300 dimensions. And why do I have three numbers there? Because the NIST had a bunch of sort of three levels of security and everyone is trying to design their algorithms to match like each of these three levels of security. So that, that's a nice way to also standardize things. And you see here now we have a failure probability. Actually, you can, if I go back here, you'll see that 
chi a, which is this error distribution, you see how small it is. So there are elements in uh, sort of integers modulo two to the 15, which is like 15 bit numbers or 16 bit numbers. But the noise you need to add for security is really, really small. It's just like from minus 12 to 12, right? So you have numbers like between zero and 65,000. You just add noise that's like minus 12 to 12 and suddenly like you're in business. So it's pretty cool if you think about it. And that's what actually lets us add noise and then correct for it and like still, like the, like the show still runs. Um, so this is a failure probability. Remember I told you there's some small chance of failure, so, but this is like really, really low and pushed down to basically be like no chance of failure. Uh, it's much smaller than 10 to the minus 18 from Sylvia McCauley's talk. So, um, and then we also have, kind of we actually do this sort of sieving algorithm. We apply all of these latest algorithms uh, and, and try to see how many bits are like, what is the sort of space and time complexity? Like we need, number, we need like two to the 144 classical steps or two to the 103 quantum steps to actually solve this problem. There's sort of more bells and whistles attached to what that statement exactly means. But it's a very standard sort of way of looking at this and there are NIST levels one, three, and five, like I said, that everyone is targeting and we also target it, gives us a way to compare across this. So the one thing I didn't highlight, which is the size, which is about nine kilobytes or 15 kilobytes. It's much larger than you expect, but we specifically were looking at sort of not trying to be too clever and not trying to sort of use fancy rings in case they're, they're going to run us into trouble in the future. So this is sort of the most conservative estimate of lattice space crypto. And I think it's still reasonable. Nine kilobytes is not the smallest. I'm like, I'm sure engineers will be complaining when, when, when I say this, but it's, it's not the worst, like the sky doesn't fall. You can see if you go to n which is this other ring-based thing that I talked about, and I think one of these values are actually uh, from projects that is like, that's done in the European Union. You'll see that these numbers are much smaller. They're smaller by a factor of about four or five, so about 2,000 bytes or so. So this is the best you can do with lattices in some sense, and 9,000 are the most conservative you can do with lattices. So we are in business, so it's gonna be a few thousand bytes. That's basically the import of this entire sort of discussion. Uh, and I know I'm talking a lot about sort of lattices, so what about other sort of flavors of cryptography? And this is kind of the boldest part of my talk, and I've never done this before, and this is not my subject expertise, so, uh, so well, we are all part of this experiment. So I'm gonna to try to explain to you something called super singular isogenies, which is, which is a very pretty interesting crypto system. It's sort of the newest kid on the block. If you ever hear the words SIDH, super singular isogeny diffie Hellman, which is like a, a sort of a competitor to lattice based crypto, you'll know, you'll know what, what, I'm, what, what it's about. So I need to explain to you what an elliptic curve group is for, this, uh, for the purpose of this talk. So just think about it as a set of points, x, y, over some field k, uh, that satisfy the sort of cubic equation, right? y squared equal to x cubed plus x plus p. So it's a set of all points. And they form a group, and y is called an elliptic curve, it's like not, not for today. Then I also want you to know what an isogeny is. An isogeny is a map, and a rational map here simply means that you kind of can go from one point to another using a rational function, right? Some numerator divided by some denominator that goes, that takes points from one elliptic curve to another elliptic curve, such that the identity function is maintained, okay? That's what uh, isogeny is. And just for mental model, you can just think of it as like, say you go from x, y to 10 x comma phi, y. Uh, in reality, it's gonna be much, much more complicated, uh, but let's just assume that it's a simple thing. And then you also just need to know that, like if you have these isogenies, you have this nice property that you pick a finite sort of subgroup of your original elliptic curve, okay? There's a unique curve and an isogeny uh, such that you can basically think of the points applied, the isogeny applied to the first point, as sort of looking at all the points on the first group modulo this, uh, this subgroup G, okay? So think about it as if you have integers, like odd and even integers. Another way of looking at odd and even integers is basically looking at the remainder modulo two, right? So two sort of generates these two groups of like odd and even integers and you can map every integer to either odd or even. And this mapping is very simple. It's just like taking the integer mod two. So at a very high level, that's what's happening, okay? So now let's see what uh, the key exchange is going to look like in the sort of new and bold world of like uh, new bold math. Uh, we have public parameters. So they are defined in blue. You have public values and then you have private values. So Alice and Bob here are the two people who want to do the key exchange. They both have this value E0, which is some elliptic curve group that everyone knows. Alice chooses a specific secret uh, morphism, so phi A, uh, isogeny, that goes from E0, and now she's able to publish this uh, curve EA, which is actually the original curve modulo some secret group A, okay? That's what's happening. So the group is secret, but this value can be public. And the fact that you can't kind of recover this value phi A from this public description of the curve EA is sort of the hard problem. So it says that you cannot quickly recover an isogeny just because you know that this, this curve and this curve has some mapping between them. Similarly, the other person does the same thing. There's a phi B, there's another group. They simply publish elliptic curve group. 
Now each person can apply the other person's map, and I won't go into details as to how to do this because it's slightly more complicated. And that's why you need this notion of super singularity, which is again is this big word, which I myself don't know a lot about, but you need that. Uh, the bottom line is just like how both parties ended up agreeing upon g to the xy, or ended up agreeing upon y times a times x, what is happening in this new sort of map is both parties agree upon the secret curve EAB, which somehow incorporates both the ma map phi A and the map phi B as well. So you apply these two maps in sequence and they sort of, you can apply them in either order. So now if you want to do key exchange, all you do is simply you pick some value in the original curve and each party can apply sort of the secret map in whichever order they choose. So this person can look at her public key and then apply his map and he, she can do the other way around. And they both end up upon a, a value, uh, upon a point at this sort of secret group that no one else knows. And then the assumption, of course, is that given this value is phi A, uh, given the values of the curves, EA and EB, some of these maps are hidden, just like kind of the Diffie-Hellman problem. So this is yet another example of post-quantum crypto. It's called super singular isogenies. And why, uh, why is this hard against sort of quantum computers? I don't know. But this is another belief, and the community is also throwing a lot of weight behind this. And again, people are doing a lot of research. So here's another example of another flavor of math. So you already got matrix multiplication and lattices. Here's another flavor of post-quantum crypto. OK, so I have a few minutes left. I'll try to leave some time for questions. So I'll just quickly run through this, and then maybe, maybe we can break. So I've talked about key exchanges. Julie talks about establishing a private channel. But I don't tell you anything about what happens if I want to sort of sign a message, make sure that it's not tampered by anyone, and then now we have a quantum computer. So do we have quantum secure signature schemes in the future? Uh, all I'll tell you is that there are sort of three big, large classes of signature schemes. There are lattice-based schemes, multivariate signatures, and hash-based schemes. So if you see any of these names out there in the wild, now you know sort of what, 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 what they are about. Uh, I won't go into too many details about these lattice-based signatures. It's kind of complicated. But all you need to know is that it sort of looks very similar to the thing. You have matrices, you have short secrets, you multiply them. Then you do this complicated looking thing that is basically what cryptographers love to do. And somehow you incorporate the message that you need to do so that your signature is tied to a particular message. Then you do some more complicated stuff because cryptographers tell you to do it. And then you end up with a signature. Okay, so that's great and very useful. But uh, all I want you to know is that there's lattice-based signatures and they're based off hard problems very similar to what you've seen. Hash-based signatures, I think, are a little easier to explain. Uh, the key idea here of hash-based signatures is that, so a hash function sort of takes inputs and kind of hashes them to a place it's hard for you to invert, okay? So if I publish y0, y00, y10, and so on, it's hard for you to get to x00, x10, and so on. It's hard to invert it. Uh, so what, what do these sort of uh, hash-based signatures look like? Well, they simply say you publish the, the outputs of the hash functions. That's your public key. That's just sort of your signature's verification key, sometimes they call it. And then your signature is just going to be selected pre-images, okay? So here, I think the shading is not very obvious, but if the message were, say, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, then you sort of selectively reveal the zeroth sort of pre-image for the first guy, the first pre-image for the second row, the zeroth pre-image, uh, first pre-image for the third row, and so on, and the zeroth pre-image. Now, anyone in the world can simply apply the hash function in the forward direction and verify that, yeah, you know what, your signature is correct, but only you know the secret keys because the hash functions are hard to invert. So you're the only person in the world who can look at this message and be like, yeah, you know what, I can give you all of these pre-images. So that sort of constitutes your signature. And you notice here there's no uh, fancy arithmetic that's going on. It's all based off these hash functions, which are these very sort of complicated objects. They're not very algebraic. So there's no sort of threat of quantum computers, at least as far as we know today. There is, however, a big catch here, though, which is that you cannot reuse secret keys. Because if I give you the signature for 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and then if I give you the signature for 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, now you can sort of mix and match, basically. right? Now you can pick the first. You can pick zero in the first bit if you want and pick zero in the second bit or, the, or one in the second bit and so on because you've already seen a lot of the pre-images. So the moment you see more than one pre-image for each bit, you're losing security. If that's not very clear, come later and like I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through it. But the, but the basic idea is that you cannot reuse secret keys. And so things become stateful. The moment you sign something, every time you sort of look out for a signature, you have to be very careful. Make sure that the message is not overlapping the previous message. It's a big pain. And uh, therefore, we need to sort of do a lot of work around this, which is what all these other schemes are based off, uh, or at least the hash-based schemes are based off of. But it does not require lattice-based or SI SIDH-based assumptions on the hardness of problems. There's no sort of fundamental problem that we're kind of grappling with and doing a lot of research attacking because hash functions are well-studied, well-understood, and they're used in a very simple way. OK, so I'll sort of quickly jump ahead and I'll say, please take these uh, sort of two URLs down. I look at my colleague's website, uh, imperialviolet.org, and look for these like CECPQ1 experiments or 2018 experiments. It'll go through about how it was experimented in Chrome. And the sort of one level takeaway was that we could, note, we could measure a noticeable impact on sort of on the internet infrastructure of deploying some of these schemes, but they're not terrible, and they can be easily accounted for. There's like a 5 to 10% latency. 
which again is not the end of, it's not the end of the world because adding a say 100 milliseconds to your page load times is not really the worst thing so things are mostly okay there's going to be some slowdown and more resources but we are doing experiments actually like on the field experiments like to find out how bad it is so with that i'll sort of quickly conclude i'll say that there's a lot of sort of there's going to be a lot of changes in quantum, in computer science you saw some in sort of the optimization uh, field in the previous talk uh, cryptographers have been on it and we have this Pico crypto conference from like 2006 onwards there are standards bodies in the US NIST. There's also EU's PQ crypto project. So it's a good place for everyone to come together and try to sort of push the field and people, they are doing that. And I hope this talk gave you a flavor, maybe a very rushed flavor, but a flavor of the future of what crypto is going to look like and some of the opportunities and challenges that come with it. And with that, I'll conclude and I'll take questions.